talking about biblical creation. It's great to know the truth. It's great to know the truth about the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and the firmament, and it's, it's wonderful to know the truth. We're going to find out some truth about the ends of the earth tonight. But if you walk away from here, if you leave here, and you don't really know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then all this good information is not really helping you. You haven't, you haven't made it yet to the finish line. So I just want to encourage you to understand that when we talk about the creation, we're talking about this right here, about Him, the Creator, who came in the flesh, died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, and He wants you to just simply humble yourself, confess your sins, repent, turn to Him, and follow Him. Believe that He shed His blood for you and that He rose from the dead and He is ever ever alive he's forever alive and he's making intercession for us and he's for us he's not willing listen god doesn't want anyone to perish he doesn't want anyone to go to hell he doesn't want anyone to be lost but he gives us the free will to choose and so you'll see this let's read this right here this is uh gospel of john it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god that's pretty simple isn't it and let's keep going. The saying was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, people say preach the gospel. Well, if I'm going to, which gospel do I preach? Let's see. Can I, can I preach it from Matthew? Yes. Can I preach it from Mark? Can I preach it from Luke? Can I preach it from John? John's the gospel, right? John starts his gospel with Jesus is God and the Creator. You hear me? Anything less is another Jesus. Remember Paul warned in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, people would come and preach another Jesus. And they'd have another gospel. Anybody that says Jesus is not God, Almighty, the Creator, they're preaching another Jesus. That goes for the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus. Jesus Christ is the one true God. He is the Creator. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the door. He is the Alpha and Omega. I love we get we get in this discussion sometime. You know, God said over and over in the in the book of Isaiah, the Lord, and he says, Yahweh. There, that's He says, What? I am the first and the last. And then what do we see Jesus saying in Revelation 1? I am the first and the last, the Almighty. If he's not God, then he's blasphemer. See, that's why the Jews wanted to kill him. They believed he was blaspheming because they didn't understand who he was. And we got a bunch of people running around. They don't understand who he is. But this Jesus, he's, he's the God of the Old Testament and the New. That's why he said before Abraham was, I am. Well, that one blew their hair back, didn't it? <laughs> or should I say there's tassels. There's each. There's a... So let's uh, let's let's turn to one more. I want to turn to um, let's go to Acts chapter seventeen real quick. Is it okay if I just preach, preach a little Bible for a minute? We don't have to have slides, do we? Though we will in a second, I promise. I, I may. I, I'm gonna keep my word. Acts chapter seventeen. I love this because the apostle Paul, I believe he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and I believe he was anointed. And I believe he was a mighty man of God, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. He fulfilled all those ministries. And he goes to Athens. And let's read. We're going to start Acts 17, verse 16 here. And he says here, he says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city holy or completely given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and said, what will this babbler say? You've been, you've been called names, have you? <laughs> what will this babbler say? Other some, he said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. But which Jesus would Paul be preaching? Is he preaching the, the Jehovah Witness God or the Muslim God? Or the, no, he's, he's preaching the, the Bible, Jesus. 
And he goes on and said, he preached them. They say, what is this? You know, look, verse 19. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus and saying, may we know of this, uh, what this new doctrine is, whereof thou speakest. So, you know, I look at these, these people as, you know, truthers that never come to the full truth, right? But they want to hear it, right? This is good stuff, though. He goes on to say, what? He says, for thou bringest, they tell me, you bring strange things to our ears. Well, the earth is flat and covered by a dome. We know, therefore, what these things mean. We want to know what these things mean. For the, all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and he said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions and I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. You know, they've discovered these altars to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. He says, God that, it is in it, God that made the world. Well, well, the creation doesn't matter. Why don't we just preach the gospel, Paul? God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Why did Paul start talking about the creation? Because he knew that's foundational to all of this. We know we're not alone. Why people, people, people reject God and they run to this alien thing because they can't bear the thought deep down that they're alone. That it's just us. So he's letting them know the God that made the world, that made the heaven and the earth. This is who I'm talking about. He says, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. See that he giveth to all life and breath in all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. I won't take time with that. It's a flat earth preacher right here. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds or the limits or the boundary of their habitation. This is probably one of the most complete succinct little true creation flat and closed and he starts talking about the boundary we'll get to that in a second but notice he says the bounds of their habitation meaning that means is it's, it's where man can go no further okay that's you look up these words exactly what it means and he says that they should seek the lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us he's not in a galaxy Far, far away. Right? He's right above us here. Looking down from his throne at us. And then he says, For in him we live and move and have our being. And it's certain also of your own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art of man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And what does repent mean? Repent of your unbelief, your sin, your wickedness, your evil. Turn from sin, follow him. Y'all like this? See, repentance is turn from sin, follow him. Admit it and quit it. Confess it, forsake it, right? It's simple. Now let's get to this. Let's, let's go ahead with the PowerPoint here. I remember reading this one day. I remember after, I don't know if it was, who it was, if it was one of the creation ministry guys. I can't remember, but they were just talking about, they didn't preach this. All right, so we've already talked about this this morning. The Bible already tells us the shape of the earth, right? Job 38, God directly speaking to Job. He says circle. Not ball, we've determined that. And he says what? The earth takes shape like, Clay pressed under a signet ring or seal ring. So we know what the shape is. Now where it gets wild, right, is we're taught on this, if, it's, if you're taught the globe or if you're taught that on the bottom of this ball is a place called Antarctica, right? And that it's a continent. And of course on a ball, 
This area down here is going to be like the north. It's going to get more narrow, and that means it's not going to be as far around. But of course, what we've discovered is that Antarctica is the boundary. It is the wall. It is the highest place. In fact, you'll see it in a second. It is the highest place on the earth. And it does have that ice wall, but even the ice wall is not really it. It's the, the mountains that are around. And it's elevation. It is the highest. I mean, even, even the scientists. Now, I'm talking what the scientists say, that it is the highest place on the earth. Right? So it's the highest. Of course, they call it a continent. We know it's not a continent. We know it's this outer wall where the dome does come down. Do we know how far it goes out here where the dome comes down? Probably not. Not exactly, because they keep that from us. But this is what we believe. Now, once you cross about halfway, that's where, you know, the equator, what we call the equator, once you cross halfway and you get over here and you start getting into the southern hemisphere on the true circular flat earth model, uh, the longitudes, latitudes, the distances are going to be off a little bit. And this has been the contention between some people. But again, how many honest people do you find today? Don't find a lot of honest people about these things that could, that'll tell the truth. But we need to discover, we need to research this thing because the, this model, what the Bible teaches us and what we know. Now, again, all maps are a little off. Okay, There's not a perfectly correct map anywhere. This is pretty close. And, of course, the, what is it? The uh, I've had all kind of crazy people. Oh, that, that, that flat earth map, the devil, you know, from flat earthers, right? I got the Pac-Man thing. He, whoop, whoop, whoop. he goes out this side and comes back this way. The sun. <laughs> that one I don't, I don't get. God said he made a circle. And he said he made the ends of the earth. Now let's, let's, keep, let's look at this. So if you have the, the only magnetic center is the North Pole, and you're standing at the North Pole, say, say there's an actual pole there, and you turn around. Any way you turn around 180 degrees... Any way you turn and you start going the opposite way from that North Pole is, is south, all right? And you end up in the place we call Antarctica, or I'm going to prove to you tonight that the Bible calls the ends of the earth, all right? Absolute proof from the Scriptures, it's the ends of the earth. Of course, how many of you have seen the, uh, the astrolabe? Have you seen the guy that did the TED Talk? Who's seen the guy that did the TED Talk on the astrolabe? Anybody seen that video? It's amazing. I don't have time to put it all, throw it all together here, but he says this in the TED Talk. This guy pulls out an astronaut. I'm going to show you what it looks like in a second. But this was a, one of the earliest instruments used to navigate the oceans. It was the first rudimentary computer. I mean, it was an accurate device for uh, celestial navigation, right? Ships would, that's how they got through the oceans. And it just happens to be a flat disk, with an upturned edge, with things that spin in there. And you, they said you could tell the time by this thing. It's so accurate. You could look at any star. You could look at the sun or the moon. You, it, had, it's just, it was an amazing thing. And this guy trying to explain how it works, he says, imagine the earth is at the center of the universe. <laughs> and then he said, I said, okay, that's easy. And the center of the circular disk astrolabe corresponds, and this is his, corresponds to the North Star, Polaris, and the paths of the sun and the moon and stars are represented by offset circles on the astrolabe. Then the man giving the TED Talk said that the, the real genius of the astrolabe was that it brought to, together two coordinate systems perfectly. Perfectly is a flat disk. And then what's so funny is he took his hand. He had the flat astrolabe disc in his hand. And he took his hand and he said, I have here a model of the sky that corresponds to the real sky. He said, in a sense, I'm holding a model of the universe in my hands. I am not lying. I watched that and I was like, wow. But then, of course, he contends that we still, he contends, we live on a ball. But there it is. What does that look like to you? Kind of looks like a flat earth model, doesn't it? It's pretty interesting. But again, it has this, what, outer ring that they everything that moves within it. That's how they do it. 
Now, I came across something in my studies, because remember, we're talking about biblical creation. I had never seen this before. How many of you know about the molten sea, or the, it's called the brazen sea? This was something that God had Solomon make when he built the temple. And it's interesting because once it was built, it was placed toward the south. To me, that's significant. But remember, the Bible says this about everything in the Old Testament. It says everything in the Old Testament are examples to us. Right? Types, shadows, pictures. God's teaching us things. You know, the lamb being slain and the blood put on the doorpost in Egypt for them to, for the death angel to pass over and not harm them. We know what that represents to us today. It was a type, it was a shadow, it was a picture of the blood of Jesus, once we apply that to our lives by faith, that the death angel, that eternal death, that eternal damnation, that eternal separation passes over us. We don't have to experience that. Well, nothing in the scripture is there just to take up space. All right, nothing. I believe what Jesus said that every word, with man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. First Corinthians 10, he says, these things are examples to us upon whom the ends of the world have come. So I, I noticed as I was reading this, this molten sea, and basically what it was, it was a brass, huge brass, round, perfectly round container to hold water for the priest to do their washings and cleansing. This is apart from the laver, all right? And it was set upon 12 oxen. And underneath it, the waters would run down and run out. And there's different people's different conceptions of it. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but this is pretty close. Now let's look at the scripture that describes it. Right here. Here's another one. This, was, this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. But this is what I said, and this is in the book. I said, it's evident by reading 2 Chronicles chapters 1 through 4 that God imparted to Solomon exactly how he wanted the temple and all the different parts constructed. This brings me to this Bible passage that just blew my mind. It has to do with the molten sea that Solomon made for the outer court of the Lord's temple. Now, here's what the scripture says. 2 Chronicles 4, 2 through 3, he says, Also, he made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim, round in compass. Anybody guess what that word is? Circle. Oh, circle, exactly. Round. So he makes it clear. Round. He says five cubits, the height thereof. Five cubits. So what are we talking about? Let's see. Fifteen feet. Yep. Give or take. So fifteen feet high. That's pretty high, right? So this. So it's got a what? It's round, and it's got a wall around it, right? So he says. 30 cubits did compass it, so all the way around, he's talking about basically the circumference, 30 cubits, and under it was the similitude of oxen, which did compass it round about, 10 in a cubit, compassing, listen to this, what does it say there? Compassing the sea round about. Have we read something like this before? He made a proverb, I mean, uh, Job 26.10, he made a boundary, for the seas, he made a boundary. And it, notice they call it the sea. So basically he made a container here that's round with an edge to contain the sea. And he set it upon these 12 oxen. The oxen are the foundation, exactly. And why 12? You could say the 12 tribes of Israel. Or how about the 12... Apostles. Jesus said that New Jerusalem on the foundations will be written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we know it's foundation. So the oxen are the pillars, the foundation. The round bowl there is a picture of the earth. Now this is what hit me, right? I have, I don't know why, I have, you know, I haven't studied Chronicles, Second Chronicles in a long time. It's not something I just stay in, right? And in research and just getting back in this, I read this and I go, this is a picture of the earth. This is the circle of the earth. This is the wall holding in the seas. This is the container. Those are the pillars. And I even believe this part underneath is like the underworld and the great deep. This is the picture. 
So I feel like, I mean, that's like, it just, boom, hits me. So I type it in to look it up, and guess what? The Jews, for centuries, have taught that this represented the world. I didn't know this. Now let me ask you something. Does any of that look like a ball? <laughs> no. It doesn't. And so I just thought that was neat. That was neat, right? We want we want to stay what? Biblical. God keeps giving these pictures, these images. There's a, another depiction of it outside the temple. And it, yeah, the oxen Three would face the north and the south and the east and the west. Of course, there it is about the 12 gates. What does it say there? Revelation 21, 10 through 14. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And I had a, and, and, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates, and the gates, 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, and on east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. There's your three oxen going in each direction. He says, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it's clearly a picture and an image of the earth, the world that we live in. Now, we believe, if you've been researching and digging into this any time, that Antarctica is not a continent on the bottom of a ball, that it is the ice ring, it is the limit, it is the ends of the earth, and it is the area that holds in the oceans, right? All water, I mean, one of the basic things, water needs a container. I don't know, if, if water's not in a container, it's in the floor. It's in the carpet. You know, it's running away from you if you're on a hill. You put, a, you put it in a container. God put the oceans in a container. And when they're at rest, they're not disturbed by the wind, they're always settled what? Completely flat. Always. Right? Always. This is what God did. Now, this is what we believe, but can we prove it? Here's some scriptures. You can pass the waters with bounds until day and night come to an end. That's Job 26.10. I quoted that a minute ago. Here it is in the Amplified. He has inscribed a circular limit, the horizon on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. Now with the Amplified, they're trying to define something here. The horizon couldn't be a boundary. That's just as far as you can see. A boundary is a limit. It's an end. It's, it's, you can't go any further. All right? It's the furthest point. So he says a circular limit. Can't be the horizon. The horizon's not the limit. He fixed a circle on the surface of the water, defining the boundary between light and dark. I was looking at it. Here it is again. Ku, to draw a circle. This is Job 26.10. Same word from Proverbs chapter 8. Draw a circle with a compass. This is not me. There it is. Circle for the one millionth time. Circle. Now, the Jacinius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon defines bounds in Job 26.10 as a defined limit. Psalm 74.17 says, Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. But you have set all the borders of the earth. God that made the world, we just read that a moment, the bounds of their habitation. God has determined the bounds, the boundary, the limit. The furthest you can go. If you keep going, there's a place where you can't go anymore. You will just be face to face with that firm, right? All right, let's keep going here. Now look at that right there. Just It blows me away, these pictures. I want you to notice something, though. Just notice this. This is, up, this is, this is the ice wall in Antarctica. First of all, do you see any white caps here? Just keep that in mind. All right? 
Let's keep going. We're, we'll have some video. But he said the Greek word here for hath determined is horion. It's the root, root word for horizon, which I showed earlier in this teaching, it means the separating circle. So the word horion actually doesn't just mean horizon. That's what our English wants to translate it. But it means the separating circle boundary. The Strong's Greek Dictionary defines horion as what? A bound or limit, a boundary line. The Greek word for bounds in this passage, uh, and I'm horathesia, I guess it is, uh, which means a limit placing. Do you see this? This is not, these are not my definitions. These are Greek lexicons for the New Testament. A limit placing, boundary line. Thayer's lexicon defines bounds as a definite limit. That's pretty strong, right? The ends of the earth. The phrase, just the phrase, the ends of the earth occurs 28 times in the King James Version. 28 times. Think about that. If you go on to refer to, the, you, you have uh, what it says, the end, just the end of the earth referring to a specific place, not the final judgment, is there um, 12 times. The phrase uttermost parts of the earth occurs seven times in the King James or the ends of the world referring to a specific location occurs twice. Altogether, this place called the ends or the uttermost parts of the earth is included in the Bible 49 times. And they use what's interesting in, in the Old Testament, there's several different words used at times, different, but it seems like they all mean the same thing. A limit, a boundary, a fence. And isn't it interesting here, you got the National Snow and Ice Index doing an Antarctic mega dunes. Why would you ever, being a smart, educated person that's going to study snow and ice all your life, why would you ever say Antarctica is the edge of the earth? How can anything on a ball be the edge? And do you know that Admiral Byrd, I was watching a documentary of him with, uh, with Mike Wallace. It was a black and white. Mike Wallace was a young man interviewing him. And when Byrd was talking about this place, Antarctica, he called it the edge. Not even the ends, but the edge. Over and over again, you see people calling it the edge and also the ends. Now, they never use this term referring to the North Pole. But the ends of the earth, the edge of the earth, it's always, I mean, I'm talking about scientists. I'm talking about Georgia Tech. I'm talking about different places, different schools. I've seen, they, they send these teams to study at the edge of the earth, at the ends of the earth. It's pretty wild. Right? Now, here's another Hebrew word just for you. It's the, the Hebrew word translated into the earth in our English translation is kanaf. The Strong's Greek Dictionary defined it as an edge or extremity. Now, what is an edge or extremity? As far as you can go, right? The extremity. Also, it's the bird, like a bird stretching forth its wings. So it's the wing of a garment or bed clothing, the flap. And notice he goes on to say, what? The border, the end. The Jesenius lexicon defines this word as the extreme bounds of the earth, the edge or extremity, and also, also the highest summit of the temple. So not only the edge or the furthest you can go, but it's also the highest place. Right now they'll tell you Antarctica is the highest continent on the earth. This is what they say. They let stuff slip out. So he says here, the Bible makes it clear that there is a definite edge, end, extremity, the furthest point or limit of something of the earth. This edge, end, extremity simply cannot exist on a sphere. It cannot. Remember, we're talking about biblical creation. You want to believe the, the NASA boys? Go ahead. I'm talking about the Bible. All right? Now, I started reading this guy. How many of you heard of Captain James Weddell? You know, there's a seal named after him in Antarctica. Some, it's a Weddell seal or something like that. And I think there's even a place there, like one of the bay areas or whatever. I don't know. But he, he went there. He uh, did an expedition there in 18... It was between 1822 and 1824. He wrote a book about it when he got back, 1825, the first edition. I'm reading here the second edition, 1827. And I actually pulled this up and started reading this book. And what this book is, he, it's, his, it's basically his journal as a captain as he traveled into what we call the Southern Hemisphere. As he, as he got into 60 degrees south and 70 degrees south. And, and he had a log 
that was based on a spherical earth, but he also had the instruments, the chronometers and compasses, and he could look at the stars, and he was uh, an expert navigator. And once he got into 60 degrees, 70 degrees south, he began to say every single day the log would say this, and I would find myself 44 miles further than I should be, where I should be, always off. He said, we're, we're, I, took the, I looked at the log, and then I took the, the readings. They were never right. He always said the variation was such and such degrees, 5.4 degrees. We're off. He said there should be land there. I can't see it. He was troubled by it because he was getting into waters that had, you know, danger, and he didn't want his men to be killed, but he, many times he couldn't figure out exactly where he was. An expert sailor, Captain James Weddle. And you can read. I read through it over and over. Day after, and he logs it, February 11th, February 12th. He logs it. We're out. So the distances were greater, and he would find himself not where he thought he was, over and over and over again. And this is before they knew they had to lie about it. Right. And after even after he reported, I think some people, some some others tried to talk him out of it. Hey, you, you were just you were wrong. You 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 didn't know what you were doing with your instruments. And he was I mean, that's like, you know. But this is this book. See right here. Just to give you an example. On the 15th at noon, our latitude observed was 68 degrees, 44 minutes by account, 69 degrees. This difference of 16 miles in latitude with easting given by chronometers makes a current in four days of north 53 degrees east, 27 miles. I mean, he just keeps being frustrated. He even starts talking about, I, well, I know the instruments are right. He goes, I know the instrument, but my log, my log's wrong. Well, he's going by the ball and not, he, he was actually looking at the stars. Now, here's another thing. Here's another scripture. Again, we're trying to, Biblical creation. About this place, the ends of the earth. This is Proverbs 34. Please pay attention to these verses. Because all of it's important. He says, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? He's talking about the wind. And then he says, Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Let me just take this off for a second. Bound the waters in a garment. When I take, when I, when I'm going to put this jacket on, Am I putting it inside my body or around the outside of my body? Right? That's how it works. So he says, who hath bound the waters in a garment? And when he says this, he's talking about what? Putting something around the outside of the waters. And then he says, follows it right with this. Who hath established the ends of the earth? The ends of the earth are an outward boundary. This is Bible. Okay, this is not my opinion. It's what it says. It's how the words are defined. Okay, then he says this. What is his name and what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Woo. Yeah, basically, you, you don't know squat. <laughs> Who hath bound the waters in the garden? Now, remember that he talks about the wind, the outer bounding or boundaries or container. And he talks about the ends of the earth over and over again. So here we go. All right, here's, here's the verse, Psalm 135, 7. He says, He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. So this is a real place. See, what, what the, the seminarians and the Dishonest creationists out there will tell you is, oh, the ends of the earth is just a figure of speech talking about just far places of pe where people live. No, he's talking about a specific place where vapors ascend. We'll deal with that in a second. He says, he causes vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightning and rain. Remember that. And he bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. Everybody see that? The word treasuries or treasures or storehouses. What is a storehouse? What is a treasury? That's where an abundance of something is, right? 
So he's saying the wind, there's an abundance of wind in this place. There's a treasury of wind, a depository of wind. Enoch says the same thing. He said, I saw the treasuries of all the winds. All the winds. I saw how he had furnished with them the whole creation and the firm foundations of the earth. And I saw the cornerstone of the earth. And I saw the four winds which bear the earth and the firmament of heaven. And I saw how the winds stretch out the vaults of heaven. So he says, I saw, and then he says, I saw at the end of the earth the firmament of heaven above. Hmm, that makes sense. Here we have the word for the, the Hebrew word for treasury or storehouses here is Otsal, depository. Look at this, armory, cellar, garner, storehouse. What is an armory? A place where a lot of weapons are stored or a lot of ammunition. What's a cellar? Another place, what? A wine cellar where they store a lot of wine. A garner, that's a place where they put a lot of barley or wheat or corn. It's a place where there's an abundance of something, a concentration of something. So when God says the treasury of the winds, he's talking about a place where there's a lot of wind. And also where this wind goes to all the earth. All right? Just making points. I promise you we're going to get there. There's the treasury, what? A place in which stores a wealth. Stores of wealth are kept. A place of where you deposit. So see, a treasury would be a place like a, well, we probably don't have any left, but there was once a place... <laughs> called Fort Knox. <laughs> there was a lot of gold there. It was stored there. <laughs> right? But, you know, there's gold in different places, but there was a concentration of gold at Fort Knox. It used to be. And these are simple. Now look at this. Job 38, God speaking to Job again about creation. And he asked this question. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? The snow and the ice. Have you been to the place where there's an abundance of this stuff? In the same context, with just a few verses before, he talked about the ends of the earth. He asked this question. See, Job couldn't know Job was a Middle Eastern patriarch. He couldn't know there was an abundance of snow at the North Pole or the South. No, there's an abundance there. So here's the New York Times. World's windiest place in... Where? Antarctica. And I don't know if you can see this down here, but it said there's a lot of wind. Right. Listen to this. On average, Antarctica is the windiest continent. Winds in some places of the continent reach 200 miles an hour. Now, that's hurricane force. I think Hurricane Andrew was 200 mile an hour winds. And we know what it did. Why is there an abundance of wind and strong wind? Well, I think it has something to do with about the way the dome is constructed and wind finding its way to that. Okay. But this right here, this is what Smithsonian.com, what? The coldest, windiest place on earth. See, they let enough truth out. What we haven't been able to do because they blinded us with composite images. And they told us the way things were. As Christians, we didn't put the Bible together with what we could actually see. See, there's enough footage of Antarctica to know, guess what? There's an abundance of snow and ice there. Now, then if you, if you watch any of the footage, you'll find out there's a lot of wind there. And they admit this, and they actually use this. Okay, They've learned to use this place because of the winds. Just here's another business inside of the coldest, driest, windiest place on Earth, Antarctica. Now, here's a little digging that I did into the CIA website. This is a... 1959 formally classified document about Antarctica. It was on the Soviet bloc international geophysical cooperation of 1959. 
And notice what they say here. They say investigations of the stratosphere made it possible to ascertain that at high altitudes, circulations of the terrestrial polar cyclone and the summer anticyclone in both hemispheres spread to the equator. So they're saying that, the, that this wind, that whatever's going on here spreads to the rest of the world, right? And he goes on to talk about the Antarctic, he said, are of great intensity. Talking about the winds of the Antarctic are of great intensity and have a frontal structure similar to Arctic cyclones. In addition, essential peculiarities of the stratospheric processes in the Antarctic not observed in other regions of the Earth. Meaning the winds in Antarctica are unique to the Earth. This was a classified document. Why would this be classified? But it's declassified. So they admit the wind there is unlike anywhere else. But well, interesting, God talks about the ends of the earth and the wind, the treasury of his wind, and the winds in his fist. So here we have, now I mentioned this last year, but I'm making this point again. Here's Because there's going to be multiple connections here. The treasures of the snow and the ice, the treasures of the wind, the treasuries, I should say. All right, NASA knows this too. Because listen, I wrote thoroughly about it in the book, so I'm not going to go into satellites are all carried by balloons, but they are. can prove it from documents going back to the 1940s all the way through to now. Okay, The military is still using balloons. All right, this is a fact. But here's NASA's balloon program, prepares for Antarctic campaign. Well, this that's 2012. They're just lying because they've been doing it since, you know, since they went there, all right? NASA's balloon program office at Wallops Flight Facility is preparing for the annual winter Antarctic campaign in McMurdo, McMurdo Station, Antarctica. This year's campaign features three missions, blah, blah, blah. The long duration balloon site established at Willie Field, uh, McMurdo, how do you say that? McMurdo? Is that right? McMurdo Station, in order to take advantage of the stratospheric anticyclone wind pattern circulating east to west around the South Pole. The stratospheric wind circulation combined with the sparsely populated continent of Antarctica allows for long duration balloon flight at altitudes about 100,000 feet. One circumnavigation, blah, blah, blah. This takes 14 days. Now, like I said, we can go back into documents. I can go back into documents 1958, 1959, 1960s. How I many of you know that the first, let me just say this. You can go to NASA's website. Just look up our first satellites, Echo 1A. They tell you it was on a balloon. But it was a satellite. Do you know that they even, NASA even used to call them satelloons? <laughs> I am not kidding. Satelloons. Yes. In their official paperwork. It's all on balloons. Now they tried to tell us, of course, that the balloon that carried Echo 1A, that was our first communication satellite, went a thousand miles into the vacuum of space. Thousand miles, a balloon made of thin mylar went into the vacuum of space, right? And carried a satellite that they were able later to retrieve. Okay. Y'all believe that. I've, <laughs> right? And here you go. You guys want to know satellite? See, some flat earthers will say, some biblical earthers. Biblical cosmology. Oh, satellites don't exist. Don't say that. They do. They're just on balloons. And they like to launch them from Antarctica because they carry them in an orbit over the circle of the earth because of the winds circulate. And remember that Ecclesiastes said the wind moves in a circuit and returns to the place where it started but they show us the ball wind patterns and it's like this. It's not what God said, right? But see, they'll tell you right here, we go to Antarctica because we need to use those circular winds. That's their words. Now here's something else. How many of you know that they just discovered 
There's already 47 known vol volcanoes in Antarctica. They just discovered a team of, uh, I can't remember, I think it was, it may have been Sweden or, I don't know, one of them over there, scientists discovered 91 volcanoes below the Antarctic ice. In fact, what they've discovered, you know, you hear all the, the climate change nonsense that man is making the world warmer and it's melting Antarctica. Now, what's melting Antarctica is 100 plus volcanoes, some above ground, some under the ice, and they finally admitted that it's the volcanoes starting to get active that's melting the ice. It has nothing to do with CO2, right? But what's interesting is, guess what's in volcanic, when there's a volcanic eruption, and, and one of the big volcanoes there, what is it, Erebus? Constantly is a, is a constantly low erupting volcano. It's constantly spitting out volcanic gases. Well, guess what's the main component in volcanic gas? Water vapor. Water vapor. What did it just say? God causes the vapor to rise from the ends of the earth it's happening more than you know here. Look at this. A massive heat source was just discovered under Antarctica driving the ice melt and volcanism or, volcanism or whatever there. Look at that. It has nothing to do with climate change. You're, they're lying to you about everything. Right. And that's even Forbes right there. Now look at this. Not only have they discovered all these volcanoes there, but what do they say now? They have realized and discovered and admit that the Earth's largest volcanic region is now West Antarctica. That means the most concentrated, the biggest number of volcanoes anywhere concentrated in one area. This happens to be the ends of the Earth where God said He, he causes vapors to rise. Now, how many of you know that water vapor in the air, coupled with wind pushing that water vapor, creates weather, lightning, and rain? Well, God said about the ends of the earth, He mentioned specifically lightnings and rain. And this is just tells you, look down here. It says, by far the most abundant volcanic gas is water vapor. U.S. Geological Survey. These are things that they admit. We're just talking about some things that they admit, right? All right. And this talks about that. Does it cause global warming? Blah, blah, blah. This is talking about that, it, that the volcanoes there, there's some that are just a continuous hot spot, continuous eruption. Have you noticed that if you watch any footage of Antarctica, you notice there's places where there's not ice and stuff? There'll be pockets of it, a little brown place here, a little dirt place here. Because there's volcanoes under there. There's heat under there. Oh, yeah. Secret. This one, if you revealed these secrets about Antarctica back in uh, 1958, you went to prison. Yeah, this, is, this document says you let any of this information out, you're in trouble. All right? So this is 1958, special national intelligence estimate number, Soviet reactions to possible United States actions on Antarctica. All right? Here's what they said. And this is in the book. This is in the book, too. It starts talking about scientific interest. The USSR has a long-established and highly developed program for accumulating scientific data in all the Earth sciences, including the geophysical fields. Such a program requires a multitude of observations during a long period and over wide areas. We believe that a major cause for the extensive Soviet Antarctic activity is the acquisition of data for this program, while at the same time serving political and prestige needs. The results of such scientific research are important to a variety of fields of vital concern to the USSR. For example, the Antarctic may be an important factor in global weather. When this was classified, you let this information out, you go to prison. Antarctica may be important factor in global weather, including that of the Northern Hemisphere, meaning it's going to affect all the way here to us. Long-range forecasting is of importance to the Soviets as it relates to such matters as agricultural production 
and marginal lands and the availability of the northern sea route. And Arctic activities might also contribute to studies of weather control in which the Soviets are taking an active interest. 1958. Where are we going to control the weather from? Antarctica. God said that's where the vapors come from, the lightning, the wind, the rain, the weather, the ends of the earth. This is 1958. And in fact, this is the reason, this concern of the United States government was the reason that they pushed for the Antarctic Treaty. Notice here, right here. It says here, the problem to estimate Soviet present intentions and their reactions to, and it's number one, the assertion of U.S. territorial claims in Antarctica accompanied or shortly followed by a U.S. call for a conference of interested states to discuss and sign a treaty establishing a multinational regime for Antarctica. A U.S. call for such a conference without assertion of U.S. claims. We're going to call for a group to take over this place that we really control so we can stop the Soviets from their weather control and manipulation plan so we can do our own. They didn't want any of them to have any advantage. All right? So you just see this is, this is stuff going on. Now, here's, here's Psalm 65. This is where the Lord really showed me something I haven't seen before. So let's read this. Okay. So Psalm 65, 4 through 7. So it says, blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, semicolon, who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth. So this is the context, the ends of the earth, comma, and of them that are far off upon the sea. So look, he's saying, the ends of the earth, those who are far off upon the sea. He's talking about a specific place. The ends of the earth, those that are far off upon the sea, which by his strength set us fast the mountains, and being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas and the noise of their waves. Oh my. Just remember all that. The ends of the earth, where he set the mountains, where he stilled the noise of the sea and the waves. Let me show you something here. There it is, what? Antarctica is the highest continent on the earth. Said that already, just so you see, these are different places. Even Google admits it. Antarctica is the highest continent on the earth. Do you see that? What do you see when you look at Antarctica from the water? You see, exactly, you see two things. You see mountains. You see the store or treasury of snow and ice. And no waves. Oh, I'm going to show you. These are different these are different locations. Look, you can even, could you do this in Hawaii in a kayak? And would you want to when the water is probably negative 30 degrees or something, some crazy cold, you know, or whatever, 32 degrees. No, look, it's not even rocking the, the kayak. Mountains and still water. O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and them that are far off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains. The mountain range there goes for thousands of miles. Y'all see that? Mountains. Highest place. Stilling the noise of the waves. Here it is. Listen, in the Bible, in the New Testament, when it talks about the uttermost part of the earth or the end of the earth, the word here is Akron. Guess what it means? The extremity, the end, the tip, the top, the uttermost, or also the highest. So it's not only the extremity or the end, but it's also the highest place. It's the New Testament. Ends of the earth. Uttermost parts of the earth. How can you have that on a ball? 
Here we go, Thayer's lexicon, highest extreme, topmost point, the extremity. Now I want to show you, here's regular waves. And I, I could pull this up, look, we go, we, I've been going to the Gulf of Mexico my entire life. I've been to the Atlantic coast. I live in California, so I've been to the Pacific. I've been in the Indian Ocean. This is what a normal shore looks like. I want you to hear the noise. I picked the Oregon coastline because it's similar to the mountains in Antarctica. The ends of the earth can't just be any coastline because all the coastlines we know of look like this. There are waves and they are loud. I could let this just play. Look at this. Now me and Faith would have fun out in that one. We would have fun in that one. Everybody get what I'm saying here? All right, let's move on from this. Now let's read this again. O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, them that are far off upon the sea, who stills the noise of the sea and the noise of the waves. Antarctica coastline. Now let me show you something. This is the Antarctica coastline. Do you know that you only get reflections in water that's perfectly still? You can see the mountains like a mirror. That's a cruise ship. I told my wife, that's where I want to go. I don't care if they won't let me on, on the <coughs> snow and ice. Just, I, just get there to see it, to observe it. It's beautiful. Look at that. See, that looks like lake water early in the morning when we were teenagers and going out to the lake to ski. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's we're ready to ski. Look at there. Now listen to this guy, all right? I'm going to play this video. It's, it's a few minutes, but I want you to watch and pay close attention because this is footage taken from multiple videos, different National Geographic, libtard places, <laughs> environmental freaks telling us we're melting the snow and they know it's volcanoes. All right, here we go. We were at the same level as everything. You know, out here, if the generator on the ship breaks down, if the ship sinks, you know, we're out of the game. And you can't bring up mummy for help or dial 999 for the ambulance. We're on the edge of the planet.
my most favorite times in the Antarctic is when you can remove all of the human sounds. And it's a silence that you can kind of feel. It seems kind of primitive. You hear ice crackling. You hear glaciers rumbling. You hear a seal barking. When you can hear your heartbeat, you know that it's quiet. Keep your eyes and ears open. If you hear a little blow, that's a minky whale.
I think between the wind and the vapor from the volcanoes, from the weather, and this, you couldn't be more specific, the ends of the earth where God sets the mountains and stills the noise of the waves and of the sea. I saw this, I was just, I was just in awe. God confirms his word to be true. I don't care. Let God be true. And every man a liar. Amen? Let's go meditate on that for a little while. Do your own research on it. Go pull up all the Antarctica footage you want. Just know this. Approaching there, it's rough. Once you get there, there's no storm. No waves. Let me ask something. Is that, is that Bible or is that Pastor D? It's Bible. God's Word is true. It is flat with features standing out. It has a sea and oceans that have a container. There is a boundary limit. There is the ends of the earth. What's interesting is when you look at the, the word for circle, you know, the word circle, kug, in Hebrew. I'll just give you this one before we go here. The word in Hebrew, kug, is with a ket, and it starts with ket, right? And then it's ket and vav and uh, gimel. So ket, vav, gimel is the word for the circle, for kug, right? The picture... The word picture for ket is a fence that surrounds. I'm not joking. All right? Vav is the nail or the tent peg that secures, meaning to secure it. Gimel is the picture of the camel lifting up the burden or to lift up. So literally, the word kug or circle where God said he put a circle, a boundary. Just even the letters tell you a fence that he secured and lifted up high. It's just, it's just amazing. See, we can be confident. That's what I'm, I want to say before we leave tonight. We can be confident that God's word is true and it's literally true. And we can sit here and talk about it. We can sit in our little dry academic offices in some ivory tower and say, it's figures of speech and metaphors. <laughs> but now you know why they hide places like this from us. Yeah, confirms the Word of God. Let's stand, everybody. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you, Lord, that you are the creator, the one true God, the one we can look to to be saved, to be forgiven, to be healed, to be delivered. Lord, the one that we know, we can know, created the heavens and the earth just like you said in your word. We can trust the Bible. It is reliable from manuscript evidence to the creation, to the science stuff that's in it, to the ge geological stuff that's in it, to everything that's in it. It's true. Men are liars. And I thank you, Lord, that your church is waking up to the truth. And more and more will wake up to the truth that your word is true and more literal than they ever knew. And we thank you for it and we pray, Lord, watch over everyone tonight. Give everyone a good rest, good sleep, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you in the morning.